Hi, this is Erin from Educated Nurse and welcome back to our channel. Today we're going to do a lecture on one of my favorite topics aside from EKGs and it's going to be on uh, fluid balance and IV solutions, electrolytes, and then ABG analysis. So we're going to dive into those. They're going to be three separate lectures. We'll look for all three of them. And if you're struggling with this, definitely check out the Etsy shop. We've got study guides um, that breaks down all three of these things a little bit farther and there's practice questions if you like the questions that we cover in the uh, lectures too. Also, if you're new to us, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, and check back on our YouTube channel. Um, we're putting up different topics from various different body systems every week, so check back there. And then lastly, if you're looking for any merch or gifts or stickers or anything, definitely pop over to the Etsy shop. We've got tons of stuff for all the healthcare workers in your life. All right, so let's dive in to one of my favorite topics. Here we go. So to start off, if you don't know me, this is just a little information about me when you can read about it on your own time. I'm also just going to include a disclaimer that all the information that's presented is really just for continuing education and training purposes. If you are working in a hospital or you're working in an EMS agency, you really just need to treat patients in accordance with your medical direction and your EMS and hospital policies, as it certainly could be different than the information that I'm providing you. All right, let's dive into electrolyte balance. Electrolytes are found in both the extracellular and intracellular fluid. Intracellular is inside the cell. Extracellular is outside the cell. Sodium is the major cation of the extracellular fluid. Potassium is the major cation in the intracellular fluid. I've kind of put a picture in here for you so you can see where their primary homes are. You can also think about primary homes as your big and your little lab values. So like potassium is 3.5 to 5. Your little, um, little ranging electrolytes kind of live inside the cell. Whereas your higher range electrolytes like sodium is 135 to 145, your bigger range electrolytes for the most part live outside the cell. Now keep this in mind. When you draw blood on a patient, um, you cannot measure what's inside the cell. You're gonna be measuring what's in the blood, which is extracellular. So you do have things like, if you're gonna run an electrolyte panel, you do have things where electrolytes, you're gonna get potassium, you're gonna get a mag, you're gonna get a phosphorus, right? You'll get those lab values, but you're not directly measuring what's inside the cell. You're only measuring what's outside the cell. So you do have electrolytes that live on both sides. This picture is just showing you what their primary home is. When you think about electrolyte causes of imbalance, you can have direct cause, and those things can be caused by illness or injury, and you can have a result of other things. So direct causes, some examples are burns, heart failure, trauma, anemia, and GI losses like vomiting and diarrhea. And then you also have electrolyte imbalances due to therapeutic measures that we um, you know, may induce. Like when we give IV fluids, we can cause a dilutional effect of some of those electrolytes. Or if a patient is taking um, a diuretic, right? So we have our potassium sparing diuretics. So sparing would be spironolactone. And then your wastings are your loops like Lasix and hydrochlorothiazide. So those can cause low potassium. So those are just a couple of examples. Your biggest ones are gonna be GI losses, and then anything that might cause a leak or damage to the cell, and then dilutional effect of our fluids. Okay, we're gonna dive into electrolytes, but I wanna just get on my little soapbox here for a second and just say that um, I think it's important as you go through nursing school or paramedic school or whatever that you really understand what the electrolytes are and what the normal values are. Um, you know, some might say, well, Aaron, that stuff is all electronic, it's printed, even the NCLEX give you the normal ranges. That's true, but I still think it's important that you know your labs. One, you should, you know, if you're going to draw these labs, you should be able to look at them and just say, oh, that's abnormal, you know, or if your patient is presenting with abnormal symptoms, you kind of have an idea what electrolyte could be off. So I think, yes, while it's important um, and we know that things are printed for us and we know that things are electronic and it's going to mark it in the chart for us, I think it's important that you still know your normal lab values. That way it helps you guide your assessments, it helps with critical thinking, and it helps you anticipate some interventions. So that's just my soapbox. That's my own thought. If you don't know your labs, I'd start figuring out a way to remember them. 
Okay, so when we start with sodium, the normal level is 135 to 145, and the primary body system affected by sodium is the brain, neural. So when you think about sodium, think about this salt shaker dumping salt on your brain. Anytime you have an abnormality with sodium, high or low, always think about it affecting the neurological system. Sodium is the primary determinant of ECF osmolality. Imbalances in sodium affect extracellular fluid. And again, water follows salt, so you're always going to have, you know, should you be looking at just sodium imbalance or is there going to be a water imbalance also? Our GI tract absorbs sodium from food and daily intake in our area of the country, well, I am i can't say our because I don't know where you're from, but in my area of the world, um, in the United States, most of our foods have plenty of sodium in them and usually daily intake exceeds the body's daily requirements. Salt leaves the body through urine, sweat, and feces and kidneys are the primary regular of sodium imbalance. Most of our sodium is found in food, especially processed foods like anything canned or highly processed, canned meats, table salt, dairy is super salty, olives, which I love, right up there with pickles, deli meats, beef, pork, sardines, chips, nuts, snacks, all the good stuff, mayo, ketchup, butter, salted nuts, and then like I said, my favorite, pickles. All right, so think about those foods, especially if you've got a patient where you need to do a sodium restriction and they're trying to figure out what they can eat off the lunch menu, just keep those foods in mind. All right, low sodium, hyponatremia. Low sodium um, usually happens from a loss of sodium containing fluids through the GI tract, kidneys, and skin, or it can happen from water excess. So water excess would be like a marathon runner who's just drinking, drinking, drinking a whole bunch of water, maybe not drinking Gatorade or something like that to replace the electrolytes. They're just drinking a bunch of water. That's going to cause a dilutional effect. There are other um, disease states that can cause hyponatremia. SIADH, which is Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. We know that diuretic hormone makes us pee, so antidiuretic hormone is going to have you hold on to the water. So again, you're going to have that dilutional effect. Heart failure and hyper, excuse me, hypoaldosteronism. Hyponatremia, so low sodium, below 135, neuro changes. Restlessness, agitation, confusion, decreased level of consciousness, headache, um, confusion, I said it twice, so it must be really important. Seizures, weakness, coma. Now, I put seizures on here, and I will just tell you from my own experience that one of the worst seizure patients I have ever had was from somebody who had a really low sodium. There was not enough Ativan in the world to get his seizures to calm down, and he seized for over an hour. Um, and it wasn't until we figured out that his sodium was super low um, that we could get his seizures under control. So... If you have a patient who has really low sodium or really high sodium, one of the very first things I would do is put that patient on seizure precautions, but we'll get to that. Hypo or hypertension, again, that's going to be more related to that fluid balance. Muscle spasms, dry mucous membranes, they're going to be thirsty probably, and cool, clammy skin. Treatments for hyponatremia, um, a fluid restriction, a fluid restriction, Add salt in their diet, a hypertonic saline solution, but be, be very careful with the sides and uh, side effects of the hypertonic solution. Um, monitor your labs, get your INOs recorded, daily weights, cardiac neuro respiratory assessments, I call that the big three, and then like I said, seizure precautions. Hypernatremia, so high salt, so this would be greater than 145, most of the time is due to excess sodium intake, right? Our, my crappy American diet, uh, excess salt in everything, it's going to lead to hyperosmolality. Um, it can happen too with inadequate water intake when you're intaking a lot of foods with a high salt content and you're not drinking enough water. It can happen with excessive water loss. Disease states like diabetes insipidus hyperaldosteronism, and Cushing's, uh, which is a hormonal imbalance, which you would learn about in your endocrine disorders. Symptoms of hypernatremia, neurochanges, just like hypo, 
dry, swollen tongue, sticky mucous membranes, flushed skin, hypotension, weight gain. Remember, water follows salt. So if there's a lot of, a lot of salt in the body, the body's going to try and hold on to that water to help dilute it. So there's going to be weight gain, peripheral and pulmonary edema, and lethargy. So nursing considerations for hypernatremia, determine the cause and treat it. IV fluids, a sodium-free solution would be appropriate or a hypotonic solution. Uh, monitor labs, you might have to give the patient a diuretic. You probably will do a sodium restriction. Measure their INO, get those daily weights, do the big three assessment, cardiac neurorespiratory, and get your patient on seizure precautions. All right, next up is chloride. The normal value of chloride is 96 to 106. And again, your lab might value a little bit depending on your laboratory facility or the textbook that you're using. In general, that's chloride. Abnormalities in chloride are usually a result of a sodium, potassium, or calcium imbalance. And really, you gotta just figure out what the underlying cause is and fix that problem, and you're probably gonna fix your chloride issue. When I've seen chloride issues in practice, I've never personally seen in 10 years of being a nurse I've never seen someone with just a chloride problem. Usually they have a sodium problem also. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's patients out there. I've personally just never seen them. Hypo uh, chloride problems. Usually the cause is diarrhea, vomiting, other GIGU losses, excessive sweating. And again, you're going to lose sodium as well and potassium. Kidney problems, respiratory acidosis. SIADH, metabolic alkalosis, steroids, diuretics, laxatives, use of bicarbonates, and some chemotherapies. Again, most of these things are going to be related to either endocrine problems, GIGU losses, or kidney dysfunction. The kidneys filter and excrete a lot of our electrolytes, so if you notice that the, the electrolytes are low, Always check kidney function because that could be the cause for a lot of these problems. Symptoms of hypochloremia are going to be the same as hyponatremia symptoms. So think back to your low sodium symptoms, same thing. It could also have, uh, patients could also have fever, difficulty breathing, and then those neuro symptoms again. Replace chloride with saline solutions. In pretty much all of your saline solutions, there's going to be chloride, sodium chloride. Hyperchloremia, again, it could be to GI losses, kidney disease, dehydration, um, acid-base imbalances, um, eating too much salt, because usually salt and chloride go hand in hand. Symptoms are going to be the same as your hypernatremia symptoms. And then, again, determine the underlying cause and um, hydrate the patient, um, get them to kind of dilute a little bit, and then you really have to consider dialysis if it's really a kidney problem. Next up is one of my favorites, which is potassium. Okay, so potassium, again, lab values might be a little different wherever you are, but your normal potassium is approximately 3.5 to 5. And K is for cardiac, and I know you don't spell cardiac with a K, but it's just an easy way to remember it. K is for cardiac, okay? Like we talked about earlier, potassium is the major intracellular um, cation. 98% of the body's potassium is intracellular. So when you're drawing blood on someone, you're only getting what's extracellular. Um, the sodium potassium pump is super important, especially when we think about cardiac, but it pumps potassium into the cell and sodium outside the cell. So you need both of those to work properly and you need a functioning heart. Um, it's also used for regulating osmolality and promoting cellular growth. Diet is our primary source of potassium. Um, kidneys are the primary route for potassium lost, um, and we excrete about 90% of our daily intake through our kidneys. Where do you find potassium? It's your green leafy vegetables, tomatoes, fruit like bananas, oranges, melons, potatoes, dried fruits, coconut, avocado, and then your dried beans, lentils, peas, and then your salt substitutes like Mrs. Dash, super high in potassium. So if you have a salt substitute, like a patient who's got hypernatremia, and you put them on a salt substitute like Mrs. Dash, you better be checking their potassium. All right, let's look at hypokalemia. 
So low potassium usually causes our potassium losses, insulin therapy, um, diarrhea, laxatives, vomiting. Again, your big, your GIGU losses, um, potassium wasting diuretics, and your potassium wasting diuretics are Lasix and spir um, excuse me, Lasix and hydrochlorothiazide. Low magnesium levels, sodium retention, metabolic alkalosis, and low potassium intake. In most patients, not all, so don't come after me for this one, most patients that are in metabolic alkalosis, it will go hand in hand with hypokalemia. Just like most patients, not all, most patients in metabolic acidosis will have high potassium. And I know there are certain disease conditions and states that will not fit that mold, but for the most part, alkalosis and low potassium go together and acidosis and high calcium go together. With hypokalemia, you will have cardiac changes if you do an EKG. You will have a U wave. A U wave is a little blip after the T wave. It's not there on a normal EKG. And when I was going through nursing school, my instructor always said, a pretty girl makes U wave. No, low potassium makes U wave, okay? So low potassium is a U wave. And I think I've got a picture of that coming up. You're also gonna notice um, other cardiac changes are gonna have an irregular pulse. They could potentially cardiac arrest on you, although some of the worst cardiac arrests I've ever seen were on the hyperkalemia side. Uh, ditch toxicity can cause hypokalemia, especially if it's being taken with a diuretic with their ditch. Fatigue, weak muscles, respiratory depression, weakness, leg cramps, nausea, vomiting, um, tingling, numbness, high blood sugar. Nursing considerations for a patient with low potassium, put them on a cardiac monitor ASAP, increase their potassium intake, and then you're gonna have to um, probably do potassium replacement, either oral or IV. Oral, you've got a couple options. You can do pills, if the patient is not critical. You can do pills. Um, they are really big, they're horse pills. Most patients don't like them because they're so big. There is like a K effervescent, which is like um, a potassium that you mix in with a drink. It kind of bubbles up. Most of them are orange flavored or there is like a cherry vanilla flavor. It's really gross. I personally like the orange one. If you mix it with a little apple juice, it tastes like tang. If anyone ever remembers tang. If you have to give it IV, you never, ever, ever, ever give potassium IV push. Let's all say that again. You never, ever, ever give potassium IV push. Potassium has to be given IV. It needs to be in a bag with normal saline. Okay? So most of the time with potassium, you're going to do 10 mil equivalents of potassium mixed in a 100, bag, or 100 ml bag of normal saline. And you run that over an hour. So a lot of times what I've seen in my practice is that they'll order two or four of those bags. And then you run, so if you have to give 40 of IV potassium, you give four 10 mil equivalents in 100 ml bags. And you give each one over an hour, so it'll take four hours to replace that. But don't ever give it IV push. Uh, you will kill your patient if you give it IV push. Uh, hyperkalemia, so high potassium. Usually this is caused by increased intake, so all those people that love to eat spinach, um, you really have to eat a lot of spinach and a lot of bananas to get your potassium up. But if you eat a lot of spinach and a lot of bananas, it's a possibility. Hyperkalemia can also be from impaired renal function, K-sparing diuretic, so potassium sparing. And I always just remember sparing spironolactone, sparing spironolactone. Um, so if you take one of those, it can hold on to your potassium. You could also have cellular destruction so anything that's going to destroy the red blood cell is going to cause that potassium to leak out of the cell and into the vessel so burns crush injuries tumor lysis infections like sepsis um, anything that's going to cause damage to the cell hemolysis which is damage to the cell and then catabolic states with hyperkalemia when you look at cardiac changes you'll notice 
that the T wave of the QRS, you'll have a normal QRS, and then you'll have a little bit of space at baseline, and then you'll your T wave. Your T wave is supposed to be small and rounded, close to baseline. In hyperkalemia, um, you'll notice that the T wave is tall and tented. So um, it can certainly be as tall as the QRS. It could be taller than the QRS, but a tall, tented T wave is too much potassium. Tall, tented T wave is too much potassium. It can also cause an irregular pulse, cardiac arrest, anxiety, irritability, muscle cramping, abdominal cramping, um, and then skeletal muscle changes. I will say the one cardiac arrest that I've seen with this, uh, the patient's potassium was almost nine, and it was because they had skipped a bunch of dialysis. Not good. Um, treatment and nursing considerations. If your patient is low or high in potassium, get them on a cardiac monitor. You might have to limit their potassium intake. I know people will be so sad they can't eat all their spinach. Uh, remove excess potassium. And then if you're gonna do hyperkalemia treatment, these are usually, the things that I've listed here are usually uh, what we give to shift that potassium. I personally like to give them an alphabetical order just to remember, and there's some reasons we do a couple of them in this way. But first is albuterol. An albuterol NEB will actually help shift uh, potassium back into the cell. Bicarbonate, again, if they're gonna be hyperkalemic, they may be acidotic, so you're gonna give bicarbonate, which is a base to help balance that out. Before we really shift our potassium with insulin, you're gonna give calcium to protect the heart. Again, uh, we're gonna find out here that calcium also deals with skeletal muscle contractions and cardiac muscle contractions. So you give calcium to protect the heart. You can give a diuretic. And then before we give insulin, you're gonna give glucose because we know that insulin is gonna drop the patient's blood sugar. So you give glucose and then you give insulin, which is gonna shift the potassium back into the cell. Then if the patient is with it enough to drink a uh, medication orally, uh, we give k exalate which helps bind to the potassium and then you poop it out. I will say from my own experience, once you start k exalate make sure you have a commode nearby or you have chucks down on the bed because once they start pooping, they don't stop pooping for a while, and it's like diarrhea. So when you're going to give K-exalate, one of the things we actually monitor is how many bowel movements that they have, because again, it's going to bind to the potassium and then you poop it out. But once they start, man, have a commode nearby. Okay, next up is calcium. Your normal calcium values are 8.5 to 11. Um, the major body system affected by calcium is your muscles, bones, um, musculoskeletal, those things, okay? Uh, so the little pictures up in the right-hand corner, ever have your eyelid twitch or your leg twitch? I don't know, for me, because I can't drink dairy, um, I have to do soy or almond milk or whatever, I can't do dairy, and I know that when my eyelid starts twitching, I'm usually low in calcium, I have to take a calcium supplement, but if I forget, um, when my eyelid starts twitching, uh, a lot of people are like, oh, you should eat a banana. You should actually drink a glass of milk. So drink some milk if your eye starts twitching. But calcium is necessary for lots of metabolic processes. It's the major cation in bones and teeth. It also plays a role in blood clotting, transmission of nerve impulses, that's why your eye twitches, myocardial or heart contractions, and muscle contractions. We find a lot of our calcium in our dairy, meat, fish, fortified cereals, beans, dried fruit, and some veggies, but dairy is the big one. Hypocalcemia, or low calcium, um, calcium goes hand in hand with your parathyroid. So your parathyroids are these four little glands that actually sit on the corners of your thyroid. When your parathyroid is not working properly, you will have uh, a decrease in your calcium. Just like when your parathyroids are working too hard or doing um, or overworking, you're gonna have high calcium. So hypocalcemia, um, you'll actually have decreased parathyroid hormone. A perfect example of this is um, when I was being treated for breast cancer, my mom actually found out she had thyroid cancer. She had her thyroid removed. Well, they had a really hard time removing her thyroid from her neck and when they did that, they accidentally removed two of her parathyroid glands. 
and the stress of surgery, her parathyroids actually quit working um, for a couple of weeks. And my mom was having classic signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. And we'll talk about that in a second. But just keep in mind that your hypo, um, your parathyroid hormones, your parathyroid glands are going to be your primary regulators of calcium. So like with my mom, when they accidentally removed two of them and then their other ones were just super stressed out from surgery, she ended up having to take a calcium supplement um, to kind of help with getting her calcium back on track. And she till, still takes a calcium supplement, but it's not as bad as it was right after surgery. So another reason, like I just said, is surgical removal of the parathyroids via thyroid or neck surgery. Injury to the parathyroid, so if you have a patient that maybe is getting uh, radiation for neck cancer or throat cancer or even breast cancer, and they injure that from radiation, um, it, can cause a, um, it can cause hypocalcemia. Pancreatitis is also another cause. Multiple blood transfusions. So within the blood transfusion bag, so the bag that the blood sits in, they use a stabilizer called calcium citrate. The calcium citrate actually breaks down calcium and it can cause hypocalcemia if you get multiple bags of blood. Um, just like if you have a bag of blood that sits around for a while and the red blood cells start to break down as it's sitting in the bag, you can actually get high potassium because of it because the cells are going to break down in the bag and potassium is going to leak out from the cell into the bag. But the calcium citrate that they use to stabilize the blood in the blood transfusion bag actually breaks down calcium. So it can cause hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia can also be due to low dietary intake. So like I said, example for myself, I can't um, do dairy. So I have to take a calcium supplement and then GI losses or a lack of absorption. Now, when you're thinking about calcium, when a patient has low calcium, they're going to have opposite hyper neuromuscular activity. So just like when your eye twitches, right, that's hyper neuromuscular activity. Your muscles are contracting really fast and twitching, and that means your calcium is low. Okay. Other things that happen with low calcium, you get the schwastic sign. Schwastic sign is where you get kind of a twitching along the, the nerves, the facial nerves in the face. You'll actually notice twitching. You can actually look up a video about this. But you uh, run a little cotton or something along the jawline and around the cheek and they'll actually twitch and have it's called the schwastic sign a trousseau sign i always think of trousseau it sounds very french it probably is french but i always think about it actually causes muscle contraction of the arm um in kind of an upward manner so i always think of trousseau sign as you're going to put your beret on your head if you're a little frenchman all right so you, you know google this one too but it's just a muscle contraction of the arm. Laryngeal spasm is a huge problem. If you're low in calcium, always be concerned about laryngeal spasms. Um, it can cause airway issues. And then numbness, tingling, seizures, and dysrhythmias. So nursing considerations, get your patient on cardiac monitoring, figure out what your underlying cause is. You can do oral or ivory replacement. Uh, most of the time we just do uh, a gram of calcium and we run it over an hour. Uh, increased dietary intake, INO, watch your labs, and then ABC is like I said, especially if you have a patient who is dysphagic or they're having those laryngeal spasms, always be concerned about airway. Okay, hypercalcemia, again, two thirds of the patients who have hypercalcemia, it's either gonna be related to cancer, or, um, hyperparathyroidism and then a third is going to be related to uh, cancer. So multiple myeloma, breast cancer, lung cancer. Hypercalcemia can also be related to vitamin D overdose and prolonged immobilization. Okay, symptoms are going to be opposite. Okay, so if it's high calcium, they're going to have hypo neuromuscular activity, muscle weakness, okay, bone pain, fractures potentially lethargy, decreased reflexes, neuro changes, nausea, vomiting, dysrhythmias, heart blocks, VTAC on uh, EKG changes. Nursing considerations, figure out a way to get the body to excrete the excess. Most of the time we do a loop diuretic like Lasix and then increase hydration. Uh, it's recommended that you do between three to 4,000 milliliters of water 
to prevent kidney stones because we know that one of the main causes of kidney stones is high calcium. They're calcium oxalate stones. So we want to make sure that we don't uh, get a kidney stone. Low calcium diet, isotonic fluids, uh, increase our weight bearing activities to get that reabsorbed by the bone. And then we might also have to do dialysis or a medication called uh, calcitonin to help bind to the calcium. Next up is phosphate. Um, and phosphate's a little, little electrolyte, so it lives inside the cell. Your normal values are 2.4 to 4.4 approximately. Now, the nice thing about phosphate, all of its signs and symptoms are gonna be opposite of calcium symptoms. And you're gonna find them in pretty much the same sources. Um, so phosphate is the primary anion in the intracellular fluid. Remember, potassium is the cation. Uh, it's the second most abundant electrolyte in the body after calcium. Um, and typically you're going to find this in your bones and teeth as uh, calcium phosphate is the source. Hypophosphatemia, one of the main causes of this is being malnourished. And this can also come from decreased intestinal absorption. So patients that maybe are abusing laxatives, maybe they don't absorb food right away. Um, you know, I'm thinking like a patient who's had gastric bypass or a ruin Y, or a patient who um, has an eating disorder, something like that. There's tons of other reasons why people malabsorb, but those are just some ones that come to my head right now. Alcohol withdrawal, phosphate binding and acids, because then you just excrete them. Parental nutrition without um, adequate phosphorus replacement are also causes. Now, hypophosphate and hypercalcium have the same symptoms. They're opposite. So just remember what your hypercalcium symptoms are and you know what your hypophosphate symptoms are. Nursing considerations for hypophosphate, treat the underlying cause, give them oral or IV replacement, and then you're going to have them ingest foods high in phosphorus. All right. Hyperphosphatemia, usually this is related to acute or chronic renal failure, lymphoma treatment, so cancer treatment, ingestion of large amounts of mild or phosphate containing laxatives, right? And then excess vitamin D intake and hypoparathyroidism. Symptoms for hyperphosphate are the same as hypocalcium. So remember your hypocalcemia symptoms. Nursing considerations. Identify and treat the cause, restrict foods high in phosphorus, like dairy, make sure they're getting adequate hydration, correct their calcium imbalances, and address any sort of kidney failure that they might have. All right, the last one we're going to talk about is magnesium before we do some practice questions as a review. Uh, magnesium, the normal value is 2.4 to 4.4 approximately, and magnesium is all about your reflexes and muscle contractions. Where do we find magnesium? In our green leafy vegetables, nuts, bananas, oranges, and my favorite coming up, peanut butter and chocolate. Usually they say too, if you're craving chocolate, you might be low in magnesium. Cereals, and then beans, dried beans. Magnesium is the second most abundant intracellular cation. It plays an important role in many essential cellular processes. Um, and it also helps activate the sodium potassium pump. So it's really needed for a bunch of variety of different things. All right, one of my favorite words to say, hypomagnesemia. Um, usually it's related to malnutrition, prolonged fasting, starvation, chronic alcoholism, prolonged parental nutrition, NG suction, and fluid loss. Uh, it can also be a relate of diabetes, diuretics, and kidney dysfunction. When someone is low in magnesium, they are going to have increased deep tendon reflexes. A perfect example of this is a pregnant patient that goes into preterm labor. Okay, so when they go into preterm labor, they're having um, multiple abdominal uterine contractions. What do we do? When that patient goes into preterm labor, we start them on a magnesium drip because they're low in magnesium. So the patient who's having contractions because they go into preterm labor, they're low in magnesium, so we put them on a mag drip. So they're going to have increased deep tendon reflexes. 
It's also going to have symptoms similar to our hypocalcemia symptoms. They could have um, neuro changes, tremors, seizures, dysrhythmias like torsades, uh, dig toxicity, hypertension, and tachycardia. For nursing considerations, the primary goal is to treat the underlying cause, and you're going to do oral or IV replacement. I will say, if you're going to do IV replacement, and this is true of any electrolyte, uh, but probably more so with calcium, potassium, and mag, if you're going to do IV replacement, absolutely monitor the big three, cardiac, neuro, respiratory, before, during, and after you do your replacement. And with MAG, you also need to do deep tendon reflexes before, during, and after. If you're giving a MAG replacement, like MAG sulfate infusion to someone, and say you've, if this is your pregnant patient again, and you're giving MAG replacement, and all of a sudden you go in, and um, they no longer have deep tendon reflexes, that means they've gotten too much MAG, and you better slow it down or shut it off. Okay, so something to consider. Hypermagnesemia uh, is usually in, due to increased magnesium intake. So cool it on the peanut butter and chocolate. Plus uh, kidney failure, treatment of preeclampsia like we just talked about are also causes. With hypermag, so just like we talked about with that infusion, hypermag is going to have decreased deep tendon reflexes. So you've got your patient, your pregnant patient, and they're on that mag replacement infusion. You go and they've gotten too much mag. Now you're checking them and those deep tendon reflexes have stopped or you can't elicit a deep tendon reflex. That means they've gotten too much mag, okay? They're probably also gonna be lethargic, dehydrated, have nausea vomiting, hypotension, urinary retention, muscle paralysis. Um, neuro changes, cardiac arrest. So again, get them on a cardiac monitor. With nursing considerations, make sure you're assessing those deep tendon reflexes. In hypermag, make sure that you're avoiding magnesium containing drugs and limiting our dietary intake. Um, we might need to give some IV administration of calcium chloride or calcium gluconate to help get our urine or um, our kidneys to excrete it. And then if it's really high, you may have to even consider dialysis treatment. Okay, the teacher and me, let's do some practice questions. First one, a uh, patient with hypoparathyroidism complains of numbness and tingling in his fingers and around his mouth. The provider would assess for what electrolyte imbalance? Hypermag, hyper-K, hypocalcemia, hypo-K. What do you think? C is the correct answer, hypocalcemia. So again, that's that hyperneuromuscular activity, hypocalcemia, and the patient has gotten um, some of that spastic sign going on there. So hypocalcemia. All right, next one. The nurse determines that which patient is at risk for developing hypernatremia, so high salt. 50-year-old patient with pneumonia and diaphoresis, sweating. 62-year-old with CHF, taking loop diuretics. 32-year-old, diarrhea and vomiting. 65-year-old with lung cancer and diabetes insipidus. What do you think? The correct answer is D. A, B, and C would probably put the patient with hyponatremia. That diabetes insipidus um, is really going to concentrate the urine, and it's going to lead to high salt. All right, next one. Which EKG change would you expect to find in a hyperkalemia patient? What do you think? The correct answer is C. Look at those T waves, man, they are pretty tall. And just remember, tall tented T waves is too much potassium. So C is the correct answer. Okay, you're providing patient teaching about what foods to avoid if their sodium level is high. What kind of things would you tell them to avoid? What kind of foods? All right, some things would be anything high in salt, uh, processed foods,
foods, canned foods, dairy, meats, um, salty nuts and snacks, chips, that kind of thing. Here's another patient teaching question. Your patient needs more magnesium in their diet. What foods would you encourage them to eat? Some of my favorites, chocolate, peanut butter. You're also looking at those dried nuts and legumes and then your green leafies. There's more, but those are the kind of the top ones. All right, last practice question. A pregnant patient is receiving IV mag to stop preterm labor. What assessment finding would warrant the provider stopping the infusion? A, increased muscle twitching. B, increased pulse. C, diarrhea. D, absent patellar reflexes. Okay, the correct answer is D. Remember we talked about if the patient has too much mag, they're going to lose those deep tendon reflexes, and that would be a sign that we would either slow or stop the infusion. All right, so here are my references. If you're still struggling with fluid and electrolytes and ABG analysis, make sure to check out our Etsy shop. I have a study guide in there that really breaks this down even further. And there's uh, practice questions in there, or over 20 more practice questions if that's something that you're struggling with and you just need more repetition. Check out our Etsy shop for the fluid and electrolyte study guide. Check out our other videos here on YouTube just for more information on IV fluids and ABG analysis, plus all the other ones we've got. And um, if you're looking for any merch, t-shirts, gifts, um, cups or whatever for any of the healthcare workers or nurses in your life, also check out our Etsy shop uh, we sell a variety of things um, for that healthcare person in your life. If you have any questions anytime, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time.